Genesis 24, verse number 1. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand unto my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go into my country, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring thy son again to the land from whence thou comest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. Now Psalm 45 verse 1, the Bible says, My heart is inditing a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready of a, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Now here you've got in Genesis chapter 24, one of the greatest chapters in the Word of God that will encourage you if you know anything about the Bible at all. In Genesis 24, you find Abraham sending this unnamed servant. Now we know who he is. We know who he is, but he sends this unnamed servant back to his home country. You see, Abraham was dwelling in the land of the Canaanites, what we call today as Palestine. And he's dwelling there, and he, he brings his servant in who has authority over all his house. And he says, I want you to go back to my home country, which is what we call Kuwait today. He said, I want you to go back to my home country and find a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said, well, I'll do that. But he said, what if I get over there and the woman won't come with me all the way to this country? He said, shall I come and get Isaac and take him back over there so that he can meet her? And Abraham said, no, I don't ever want my son to go back to the land again. So what you've got here is a picture as Abraham as God the Father. You've got the unnamed servant as the Holy Spirit. And you've got uh, Isaac there as a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and this woman that he's going to find is a picture of the church. So what you have is one of the greatest examples of the rapture of the church and salvation and all these things. You've got it in chapter 24. It's a great chapter. You ought to go home and read it uh, sometime this week and get a great blessing in your heart when you realize that God puts these things in the Old Testament for our learning and so that uh, it will help us, it will encourage us so we see this event happening in the life of Abraham and Isaac and the unnamed servant, and then Rebekah uh, is the woman that he finds. And he goes and he finds Rebekah, and he brings her all the way back to the land of Canaan. Now, we don't know how long that took. They were riding camels and things like that. We don't know how long that took. Could have took two weeks, could have took a month. Who knows how long it took. But he brought her all the way back. He brought the, the woman, the young lady, Rebecca all the way back to his homeland where he sees Isaac standing in the field. And when Isaac sees him, he starts coming to him. And Rebecca sees Isaac. She knows who he is because she spent a whole month talking to the unnamed servant about Isaac. So when she sees him, she knows who he is. She jumps off the camel. And that is a great picture of salvation. It's a great picture of the rapture. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, preach to you a little bit. In chapter 45 of the book of Psalm, in, uh, you find out about uh, there in Psalm 45 that this is a, a, a picture of the marriage of the Lamb and His bride and the, uh, called the church. Now, if you can decipher it, the whole chapter, chapter 45 of Psalms, the whole chapter describes the bridegroom and the bride and the maids of honor and the guest licks guest list if you can decipher it. To think about all this is indeed to indict a good matter. Thinking about the rapture is a glorious thing. It'll excite you. It'll encourage you. When you think about the rapture going to take place, it is a blessing. And it's going to happen very soon when the Lord Jesus Christ comes for His bride. And I, I preach on the rapture not near enough. There's so much to preach. I, it's just I don't ever get around to the rapture near like I'd like to get around to it. But uh, you think about the rapture, you could define it, as a, define it as a catching away. That's what the word actually means, catching away. 
The rapture could be defined in this way. The Latin word also means to seize by force, to snatch something or transport something by force. Our English word rape comes from this word, or rapture comes from the word rape. Like the word trinity or premillennial, rapture does not occur in the Bible. You'll not find the word rapture in the Bible. It's just a name we stuck up on it to describe an event that's going to take place. And it's going to take, sud take place suddenly, and it's going to take, take place violently, and it's going to take place very soon. And if you will, the Lord is going to rape the world of Christians. God's going to take us out of here. We'll be gone one of these days. And it isn't a new doctrine that I'm talking about. It's a doctrine that's been preached since the disciples, since the apostles, and the Bible is filled with this teaching. Jesus warns his people to watch, and then he gives them a clock to watch by. He said there are four watches in a night. He said, I'm going to come in one of those watches. Well, he didn't come in the first watch. He didn't come in the second watch. He didn't come in the third watch. So he's got to come in the fourth watch, and that's the watch that we're in. We're right at the close of the fourth watch. Now the apostles preached it. John over there in the book of Revelation, he preached about the rapture. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. He preached about the rapture. Uh, Peter preached about the rapture over there in 1 Peter. Paul preached about the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Church history is filled with God talking to the people about His coming. You find it over there in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. You find it with Ephesus over there. Uh, they're rebuked for not looking. You find it with the church of Smyrna, who are promised a crown of life at His coming. You find it with the church of Pergamos over there, rebuked for settling down in the world and not looking for the Lord to return. You find it with the church of Thyatira, who was filled with sound doctrine. They were yoked up with the world, and they, uh, they were told to hold on until He comes. In Sardis over there, you find the Dark Ages, where they're warned that Jesus would come as a thief, then with the church of Philadelphia, you find that the church was uh, the church of the open door, and it was a promise of deliverance from the great tribulation period to come. Now here we are in the last church age called Laodicea. Here we are right there in that church age, and what you've got is a group of people on this earth today that are not looking for Jesus Christ to come. Furthermore, I think most of God's people don't want Him to come. It would mess up their plans. It would mess their, mess their uh, what do you call it, 401Ks. It would mess up everything. It would mess their retirement up. They'd rather the Lord not come. Brethren, the last prayer in the Bible, even so, come, Lord Jesus. You should be wanting the Lord to come. You should be desiring to be here when He does come. Here in this Laodicean church age, people have tried and tried and tried and tried. They've tried over and over again to guess when the Lord's coming back. And all their systems has failed. The seven systems failed. The seven seven system failed. The seventh day Adventists has failed seven times. Uh, the Larkin system failed. It's all failed. You know why? Because no man knows the day nor the hour when he comes. But we're close. We know the signs and the seasons. That's what the Bible said in Thessalonians. We know the signs and the seasons. We know He's coming. And it can't be far off. All these systems have failed because no man knows the day nor the hour. The calendars aren't right. But we know that we're close. Because using the one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, we know that we're close. Man is only going to be on this earth for 6,000 years. And then the Lord's coming back, and He's going to be here on, on this earth one more thousand years when Jesus Christ reigns in Jerusalem. Seven is all there is. Seven is all there is. Man's going to be here 7,000 years, and then you're going to start a new heaven and a new earth. That's what's going to happen. Now, we've been here six. There were 4,000 years before Christ. There have been 2,000 years since Christ. So that's six. So we're very, very close. The only reason we ha haven't left yet is because our calendars aren't right. That's all it could be. But we're close. Now what if the Lord were to come today? Would you be ready? Would you be excited? 
if you knew the Lord was coming today, would it excite you or would you have to go home and throw out some stuff? Or would you have to do this or do that? Would you dread the coming of the day of the Lord? When Jesus Christ was here on the earth, He hinted about a pre-resurrection resurrection. And it's found in John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection. So He's the first fruits over there in 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 25, He said, He that believeth, though he were dead, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 said, The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then he says in verse 26, he said, He that believeth and liveth. So that is Christians that are alive at the coming of the Lord. The Lord gave us a clock. He gave us a stopwatch. He gave us something to look at. We know the signs and the seasons. We know that he's close. We just don't know the day. and We don't know the hour. But I can tell you this, he's coming. He's coming. It's even at the doors, as the Bible says. He said, when you see the budding of the fig tree, Israel becoming a nation, which they did in 1948, he said, this generation shall not pass away. The budding of the fig tree, 1948, brethren, the Lord is close to coming. We even find that God's mysteriously mentioning and hinting about the, uh, about the second coming, and he gives the two classes of people. He says, the dead and the living. And this pre-resurrection resurrection is going to take place. He talks about it over there in Isaiah chapter 26. Now listen to this as I read Isaiah 26. He said, Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. What about that? That's the Lord talking. He said, Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. That's a pre-resurrection resurrection. He says, With my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For the dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers, and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth shall also disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. You know what you just read? You read about the rapture. All the way back over there in Isaiah 26. What about that? God said, they're going to live with my dead body. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and he rose from the dead. And he said, when he comes back again, the dead in Christ shall rise first. In fact, when he rose from the dead, the Bible said in Matthew 27, that a lot of the saints which slept arose with him and walked about the city. Now, they died again. But one of these days, the rapture is going to take place, and God's going to raise the dead, and He's going to raise us up with them, the living, and we're going to live with Him forevermore. Some of us are never going to die. Amen. Isn't that going to be a blessing? Amen. The Bible said in Psalm 50 and verse 4, He said, He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that He may judge His people, gather my saints together unto me and those that have made a covenant, covenant with me by sacrifice. Back up there in Isaiah 26, He says, Come into my chambers. He said, until the indignation be overpassed. That's the tribulation period. God's going to rapture the church out of here. He's going to take us up, and we'll be in heaven. While we're in heaven going through the judgment seat of Christ and rehearsing the second coming of the Lord, down here on earth, they're going to be going through the great tribulation period. He said, come into my chambers, and I'll hide you from the indignation that is yet to come. He said, for the Lord's going to come out of his place going to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. That's Revelation 19, Jesus Christ coming again to this earth to punish the Antichrist and to punish the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds and of all their ungodly ways. The Lord is going to judge the earth. The Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 8 says this, The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains and skipping upon the hills. My beloved is as a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. You know what the Lord's doing? He's hiding. When he comes back, you know what he's going to do? He's going to come back in the rapture. You know what he's going to do? He's just going to come to the clouds. And that's like looking through the lattice. He's looking at the windows. You know why he's looking at the windows? He's looking at the windows to see if anybody's looking for him. Are you looking for him? 
He's looking through the windows to see if you're looking for him. And he looks through the lattice. What's he doing? He's hiding. And he's going to call the church up, and the church is going to meet him in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And we're going to go on to heaven with him from the clouds. Nobody on earth is going to see him. None of the un unsaved are going to see him. You remember when he rose from the dead over there? He appeared unto about 500 brethren. He didn't appear to Pilate or Herod or none of the unsaved. He just appeared to the believers. And when Jesus Christ comes back in the rapture, he's just going to appear to the believers. And then he's going to take us on into heaven. What a glorious day. You say, ah, oh, preacher, I don't believe that. Well, just hang around and see. Just hang around and see. We'll find out. I'm going to leave here one of these days. I'd rather leave here by the upper taker. I may have to go by the undertaker. But either way, I'm leaving this place. And the Lord's going to take me with him. My beloved, that's Jesus Christ, is coming. And he's coming secretly like a thief. And he'll hide behind the walls or the clouds. And he'll look through the lattice at the windows. He's wondering if the bride is looking for him. Are you looking for the Lord to come? Or do you just go through your daily life day by day by day and you never look or expect the Lord to come? That's when He's going to come, when nobody expects Him to come. He's coming. He's coming. John 1, John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, he says this. He said, Now little children abide in me that when He shall appear we shall have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. There you go, Christian. I think there's going to be a lot of Christians ashamed at the coming of Jesus Christ. One reason is they're not looking for him. Another reason is they've not served him. Christians, we were saved to serve. We weren't, we weren't serving to be saved. We're saved to serve. We're serving because we are saved. And you need to get a hold of that. You're not trying to work your way to heaven. Jesus Christ took care of that when he died on the cross and rose again. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to heaven. But you're serving because you are saved. Is the Lord going to find you serving? And then He's going to say, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. He's going to say, Come up hither. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Come up hither. And brethren, and the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 15, the moment of a twinkling of an eye. Faster than that. Boom, we're gone. We're out of here. We're in the clouds. And we're looking around saying, what happened? What happened? And all of a sudden we look and we see Jesus Christ. Won't that be something? Amen. The Bible says in Revelation 4, 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. In Revelation chapter 1, you have church, churches, church. Revelation chapter 2, you have churches, churches, churches. Revelation chapter 3, you have churches, churches, churches. Revelation chapter 4, a door is open to heaven and somebody says, Come up hither, and you don't see the church again till chapter 19. We're gone. We're out of here. Are you ready to go? You better get ready. It's time to go. Now, all that's technical information. God has given us a beautiful picture in the Word of God that talks about this rapture, and that's in Genesis 24. Abraham is a picture of God the Father. He's a type of God the Father. And he calls out to his unnamed servant. Now, we know who that servant is. But he, he, doesn't, give him his, he doesn't give the name of that servant because you know why? Because that servant does not talk about himself. That's what Jesus Christ said about the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 13, he says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak Amen. of himself. Amen. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. You know what the Holy Spirit doesn't do? He doesn't run around saying, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. There's a lot of Pentecostals and, and a lot of Christians today that run around talking about the Holy Spirit this and the Holy Spirit that and the Holy Spirit this. One thing you can know is that it's not the Holy Spirit because he doesn't speak of himself. He talks about Jesus Christ and God the Father. That's what he does. So you see the servant sent 
the servant sent there in Genesis 24. He's unknown by name, but he's unwavering in his obedience. You know what the Holy Spirit does? He does what he's told. He goes around and he convicts the hearts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. He deals with us as Christians. He guides us and he comforts us and he helps us to get through this world. He's taken us home. That's that unnamed servant. He's got Rebecca and he's taken her home and he's being a comfort to her. That's us in the Holy Spirit. He's unrestricted in his approach. He'll do whatever it takes following the word of God to get a bride. He'll convict. He'll convince. He'll deal with a man's heart till they understand their need for Jesus Christ. And then he'll save them. Then you see the search of the servant. He's seeking a willing bride there in verses 5 through 7. He's seeking a willing bride. He wants a bride that, that wants to come. You know what the Holy Spirit's doing today? The Holy Spirit's not making people get saved. He didn't make me get saved. He didn't make you get saved. He just offered. So what this unnamed servant does, he goes in over there in, in Abraham's land, and he's over there with Abraham's family, and he said, my father had this, and he's got that, and he's got houses, and he's got lands, and he's got all these great things. Look at all the stuff I brought. He said, I've come to get a bride for Isaac. I've come to get a bride for Isaac. And he's searching, and he's looking, and he goes to that far country. And he's looking. The Holy Spirit has come from heaven down to this earth looking for the bride. He said, For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The Bible said in Romans 10, 13, He said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible said in Revelation 22, 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. You know what the Holy Spirit's doing today? He's saying, come, come. You know what Jesus Christ said? He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. You know what God the Father said? Back over there in the Old Testament. He said, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know what the Lord's saying, the Holy Spirit's saying today? He's saying, come, Amen. come, Amen. come, come. Then you see the servant rewarded. He goes over there and he finds this girl. He finds this woman. A decision is demanded. And the unnamed servant tells the family, he said, don't hinder me, don't hold me up. He said, if she's going to go with me, let me go. I've got to get back to my father. And if she's not going to go with me, then I've got to look for somebody else. So they go to Rebecca and they say, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. You know what the Holy Spirit did to you one day? He came to you and he says, Will you go with this man? And you look at Jesus Christ and his death and his burial and his resurrection. And you said, I will go. Amen. Amen. And you went. Amen. And ever since then, the Holy Spirit's been leading you along. And he's been telling you all about Jesus Christ. So when you see him, you'll know him. She enlightens, the servant enlightens the bride. The, the bride sees Isaac through the servant. The Bible says, How be it when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. You know what that unnamed servant did all the way back home? He didn't talk about himself. He talked about Isaac. He talked about Abraham. And he gets her all the way home. And when she sees Isaac in the field, she knows who he is. When you see Jesus Christ coming in the cloud, you're going to know who he is. Amen. The servant escorts the bride all the way back to her master. She journey, he journeys with the bride until he meets his master there in verse 61 and through 65. The Bible said, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Once you receive the Holy Spirit of God, you're saved forevermore. The Bible said in Ephesians chapter 1, he says, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. 
In other words, when you get saved and that Holy Spirit comes in there, He's not going to leave. He's going to get you home. He's going to get you all the way home. You say, but all preacher, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been into. You don't know my thought life. You don't know what I've been into. I know this, that if you're saved and born again, you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit's in you, and He's going to get you home. You may have to go home kicking and screaming all the way, but you're going home. He escorts her all the way back. He joins up with his master in the field, verse 65. The Bible said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18, He said, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Can I ask you a question this morning? Does it comfort you to know that Jesus Christ might show up today? Is it a comfort to your heart? Well, if it's not, you need to get right with God. If you're saved, you need to get right with God. Get it under the blood and be looking for Him to come because He's going to descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord... We get to go up and meet him in the clouds. And then he's going to look around and he's going to say, we're all here. And the church is going to say, we're all here. He says, let's go home. He takes him on home. You know what Isaac did with Rebecca after he got her? He took her to his mother's tent. And the Lord is going to take us home to our father's place. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That comforts your heart. Comforts mine. Oh, I know the judgment seat of Christ is a terror, and I'm dreading it. I'm dreading it. But I'll be with the Lord. I'll be with the Lord. And I'll never leave His side again. Never. Wherever he's at, there will I be. Why? Because he's my Isaac. He's my Isaac. And I love him, and he loves me. More importantly, he loves me. The joys of the search is completed there in verse 66. The detail of the tasks were given there in verse 35. And he describes the search for his master. One of these days, the Lord's going to get us home, and the Holy Spirit's job will be complete. The rapture. Do you believe it? Do you believe it, folk? Do you believe it? Are you so, this world got your mind so far away that you don't even think about it anymore? What if He comes today? What if He comes tomorrow? What if He comes this week? What if He comes this month? What about, what if He comes in 2022 will you be looking for him will you be anticipating well the Holy Spirit's trying to get us home and he's going to get us home but he's trying to tell you all about him until we get there I, my heart is indicting a good matter this morning I wish he would come today Dr. Upman used to say if God would give me an answer to prayer in the next 15 seconds, you better be ready to go. Because we'd be out of here. Father, thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for a time to be here this morning.